Kyle Busch ripped the 2019 Aero package to shreds yesterday in his post-race interview. Now, usually I don't like to use strong words like that, like ripped it to shreds. I don't like to overly sensationalize things. But in this case, I think Kyle Busch's quote warrants it. <laughs> How's it going you guys? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. Now today we're mainly going to talk about fallout from the Dover race yesterday. Uh, when I recorded my video that I uploaded shortly after the race yesterday, uh, as I was in the process of editing that video, some other news came out. We saw some very inflammatory quotes from some drivers, some differing opinions. Uh, we had some news regarding Denny Hamlin I'll talk about as well as a few other things. And uh, since I was already in the middle of editing that video and since my schedule with school was jam-packed yesterday, I didn't have a chance to go back and make another video where I covered these extra topics. Uh, so instead, I pushed it to today, but better late than never we're talking about some of those quotes because that was probably the most interesting thing of the race yesterday. You wouldn't expect after a visit to a mile long racetrack we would be talking about the aero package. Typically it tracks under a mile or a mile or less in length. The aero package doesn't usually come into play but Dover with its high banks, high speeds, uh, it did and several drivers had strong things to say about it. A couple drivers had slightly different things to say about it as well. I'm gonna read you some quotes. Uh, we're gonna look at a few different sides of this, a few different opinions and I'm gonna give you guys my thoughts and really my general opinion, my general stance on this topic because I don't really like to get back into that debate where is this aero package good? Is this aero package bad? I think I've been pretty clear on my stance as far as that's concerned, but I want to give you guys kind of the insight into my general way of thinking when I go when I go about criticizing things in NASCAR. But before I get into that, I do have a couple other things I want to touch on. Uh, apparently after the race yesterday, Denny Hamlin, uh, who finished 21st, had some issues throughout the day, uh, had to be taken to the infield care center immediately following the race. He was released pretty shortly thereafter, so it wasn't a major thing, but there was reports that uh, possibly Possibly fumes were leaking into the cockpit of his race car during the later half of that race due to damage uh, that he'd sustained during when his tire cut out uh, in midway through this race. Hamlin had a rough day early on. He struggled with handling, lost a lap, and then later he was actually able to get back on the lead lap, but then had a tire go down. That's likely when the damage that would have possibly led to this issue occurred. Uh, Denny Hamlin, though, was okay. We heard from several drivers, though, after the race that with this newer aero package, with the slightly higher speeds, the added G-force, the added pressure in the corners uh, at Dover, uh, several drivers said that this race was harder on them physically than past Dover races. Denny Hamlin, it sounds like, unfortunately got the worst of it. But he was okay, like I said, he was released from the infield care center after a little bit of treatment, so uh, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it's a major development. I expect Hamlin to race this next weekend. I don't think there should be any uh, ongoing issues here, but definitely something I thought uh, was worth mentioning. Another interesting thing that I saw a few people tweet about, so I'm gonna go and mention it briefly, was immediately following Monday's race at Dover, because remember, the race was pushed to a Monday. Fox Sports 1 immediately then went into their typical programming where they have you know sports shows, talk shows throughout the day, and immediately following the race, they had Jason Whitlock uh, with his show. I'm not actually sure what the show's called. And he spent a little bit of time on his show talking about Bubba Wallace specifically. Now I can't play any clips because it's from Fox Sports 1 and they'll get mad at me, but in a nutshell he was basically kind of just discussing why Bubba Wallace, who's currently the only African-American driver in NASCAR's top series, why he's not attracting more sponsorship. Why Bubba Wallace, and we've been talking about this in recent episodes, why Bubba Wallace and that 43 team are struggling with sponsorship given the marketability of Bubba. And the way Whitlock explained it, he said, you know, that corporate America these days is very diversity focused. Uh, it's a big initiative, you know, nationwide these days in advertising. So why then is Bubba Wallace not drawing more eyeballs, not drawing more support from you know sponsors? He brings up some interesting points, but he definitely omits a few details. You know, it's obvious Jason Whitlock doesn't watch NASCAR, at least not regularly at all. Uh, he understands the basics. He doesn't understand any of the the, the the details there or anything. But I think my big takeaway is from this is that it was cool to see kind of a general like nationwide sports commentator actually take a few minutes on his show to talk about NASCAR. Uh, unfortunately, he was kind of off base here. Because yes, I am surprised that Bubba Wallace being the only black driver in the Cup Series, I'm surprised he's not drawing more interest. But the thing Whitlock fails to really point out in his little spiel is that, you know, the finishes, the results are not there. He mentions in his little segment, oh, Bubba Wallace, he finished second of the Daytona 500, so obviously he can drive. Those of us who watch NASCAR regularly know that Daytona isn't necessarily the best way to test a driver's actual skill or even a team's uh, success. Just because you perform well, run well at Daytona does not mean you're performing or running well at the other 32 non-super speedway races. So Whitlock misses those important details, but it is interesting to hear him talk about Bubba Wallace. At the end of the day, unless that 43 team can start running better, they're not going to draw in many outside partners. Uh, that's really the issue. Unfortunately, it's kind of a downward spiral for them. They need to finish better to get more money. Unfortunately, though, they don't have enough money now to run better, so it's kind of, unfortunately, not going well for Richard Petty Motorsports. Uh, Bubba Wallace, you know, he sent some cryptic tweets out lately. I'll flash a couple of them up on the screen right here for you guys. He's talking about dark times, how things are rough, how he's just trying to push forward. 
I feel bad for Bubba Wallace. Now, to be fair, I do feel like most of the criticism I've seen, at least, has not been directed at Bubba. It's been mostly directed at Richard Petty Motorsports, which I think is fair. I think Bubba deserves 30-40% of the blame, but I think 60-70% to 70 goes towards Richard Petty Motorsports. The way they handled Smithfield Foods leaving was not professional. The way they've organized their team since then is not professional. And Bubba Wallace, I've never, from the beginning, I don't think anyone in NASCAR thinks he's an actual Cup Series championship level driver, at least not yet. He's a good Xfinity driver, a not-so-good Cup Series driver. That's who Bubba Wallace is. And if anyone wants to refute me on that, I dare you to find stats that to support your argument. So ultimately, unless Bubba Wall starts running better or Richard Petty Motorsports starts running better, they're not going to have a good an easy time finding outside sponsorship. So anyway, that's what I want to talk about there. Whitlock, interesting again to hear a national sports commentator talk about NASCAR. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, though, it's clear he doesn't watch very often. All right, I'll get to it now. Let's talk about some of the driver quotes following Dover. We had a few high-profile names basically debating, not really debating, kind of just bluntly stating their opinions about the aero package because after Dover, which Dover, it's always been a track where it's hard to pass uh, because of the high speeds, the, the kind of narrow, it feels like narrow racing groove, especially on corner exit, the way the cars kind of come rising out of there. Cars are very hard to handle, so you don't see a lot of side-by-side -side racing at Dover. Uh, but after this race, questions arose about the package, about the cars, especially with the higher rear spoiler on the car, how that might have affected things. And we had a few drivers saying kind of the same thing but in very different ways so the one quote that caught the most attention on social media of course was from kyle bush so i'll start off with his quote and i want to compare his quote to a few other high profile drivers quotes about the same topic so here's what kyle bush said immediately following the race at dover yesterday the package sucks no question about it it's terrible all i can do is bitch about it and fall on deaf ears and we'll come back with the same thing in the fall typical kyle bush being very blunt uh, I would say he's straight to the point, but he doesn't really have a point here other than he doesn't like the package. He doesn't say what he doesn't like about the package. He doesn't talk about uh, any of the issues, any of the specifics uh, regarding the package. Is it the rear spoiler he doesn't like? Is it the whole thing he doesn't like? Because, you know, I think this package, you know, still has 750 horsepower, which I think most fans are okay with. Uh, what about this package and what about the racing does Kyle Busch not like? He doesn't go into any more detail there. I want to compare his response uh, to Kevin Harvick, who also gave a quote regarding this immediately after the race. Kevin Harvick said, here's the thing about the package. I think that NASCAR tried to accomplish a lot of things with one particular package, but you look at how the cars drive behind each other, and from a driver's standpoint, it's hard to race them anywhere. Now I want to focus on the differences between these two quotes, because I have strong opinions about both. Firstly, I want to make it clear, I agree with both drivers that this aero package did not make the racing at Dover better. I don't really think it made the racing worse than we've seen in recent years. In fact, uh, I'll pull up a tweet here from Apex Off, who has been looking at this data recently, but I'll show you this tweet right here, or this chart at least. This compares the last six Dover spring races. You can see the winner, you can see how many leaders, you can see the margin of victory, you can see how many green flag passes, how many quality passes, and you expect in a race where a bunch of drivers are complaining about the error package, complaining that it's too hard to pass, that you can't do anything, you'd expect that this race would have had record lows for the number of passes and leaders. And as you just saw in that chart, right there, uh, that couldn't be further from the truth, as a matter of fact. Looking at it again, you see that this race yesterday had uh, more leaders, more different leaders in it than any of the most recent uh, Dover Spring races. It had the second most amount of green flag passes, it had the third most amount of quality passes, and that's despite it having the least number of cautions, which I feel like restarts bunches the fields together, you'd expect races with a lot of restarts to have more passes, but no, this race had the fewest number of cautions, and still had the most, or second most amount of passes. The only real negative to the race there, as you saw in that chart, was that Martin Truex Jr. won this race by almost 10 seconds, which uh, meant it was not a dramatic finish in the slightest. So he kind of put a whooping on him that final uh, 100 laps or so. Now, I know the number of passes doesn't automatically mean it's a good or a bad race. You know, there's an eye test involved. And watching that race yesterday, it was, like I said on my groovy gauge, it was a mediocre race. It wasn't super remarkable. Now, seeing that chart, uh, and then also just watching the race on TV, uh, I, you can see why I was surprised to hear so many negative comments from Harvick, from Bush, from especially from Bush. And this is where I want to focus on the actual quotes themselves. Uh, Kevin Harvick, I'm not a big fan of Kevin Harvick, I'm also not a big fan of Kyle Bush. Uh, Kevin Harvick, in my opinion, perfectly exemplified how modern NASCAR criticism needs to be Formed. He highlights exactly what he believes NASCAR has done wrong, and he explains why he doesn't think uh, it's working, or why he doesn't like it. Versus Kyle Busch, who immediately turns to emotional venting of sorts. Kyle Busch's quote offers no constructive criticism, doesn't even really acknowledge what the problem is, he just says, with several expletives thrown in there, that the package sucks. Doesn't say why. I know Kyle Busch has probably been the most outspoken critic of this package since the beginning, uh, but it is interesting to me that whenever he does seem to talk about the package, whether it's early in the year, when he said, rather than explaining anything about the package, just said, anyone could drive these cars. And now here he is, he's just saying the package sucks. 
The problem there is there's nothing constructive there. There's nothing that offers actually any real insight. It's just sound bites. It's giving journalism sound bites to put on headlines. I'll probably put it on the, in the title of this video if I'm smart because that's what draws people's attention. They see Kyle Busch says the package sucks and fans are going to believe the package sucks. And some people will support Kyle Busch in these types of quotes. Bob Levine, owner of Levine Family Racing, chimed in on Twitter as well. Let me second Kyle Busch's statement. This package sucks. Has nothing to do with where he finished. Now here's the problem with this. I'm not going to argue whether or not Kyle Busch is right or wrong. I agree the package wasn't built for Dover. It doesn't make Dover any better and I agree that this aero package is not perfect. I was fully, and I don't want to keep going back to this, but people are always going to misquote me on this. At the very beginning, when they first announced this package, I didn't say it was the future of NASCAR. I didn't say it was the perfect package for the long term. I said, hey, for these two years, bridging the gap until we get to the Gen 7, I'm okay with NASCAR trying this new thing because, as we've seen at places like Texas, it, it has improved the entertainment and the watchability of some mile and a half races. Which, if you remember even just a year ago, fans across the board were complaining about how boring most mile and a half were with the current Gen 6 body. So therefore, since I knew NASCAR couldn't make any major modifications to the Gen 6 car until 2021, I was perfectly fine and still am perfectly fine with NASCAR experimenting with this radical aero package this year. And like I said, it's improved the racing at Texas uh, and really, I don't really think it's hurt the racing uh, significantly at least at any other track. In fact, it also helped Talladega if you count that. So that's my stance on it. That doesn't mean I disagree with Kyle Busch here. When he says the package sucks, I wouldn't phrase it like that, but yeah, this package is unnecessary for Dover and I don't think it's great for Dover. But it's the way he says it. You know, I've said this before, NASCAR has an optics issue. Uh, sports fans, when they look in to NASCAR, what do they see? They mostly see fans squabbling back and forth with each other, constantly arguing about every small change the sport makes. NASCAR fans are split down the middle on 90% of issues, and outside fans see that, and who on earth from the outside would ever want to join a fan base that is literally constantly in the middle of, of a bloodthirsty civil war of sorts? I know I certainly wouldn't. Uh, Y'all trapped me here in 2004, and unfortunately because I've been so invested for so long, I can't leave. I feel like I can't leave, but if I was not a NASCAR fan, I would not jump into this bloodbath, believe me. And so when you have one of the highest profile drivers in the sport offering no constructive criticism, offering no value to the conversation, just spewing out jargon like this, sensationalizing things, this package effing sucks, that's not helpful and that only hurts NASCAR's image, an image that NASCAR desperately needs to rebuild right now. So when Kevin Harvick comes at it from a different angle and actually offers some constructive criticism of sorts, I support that. I don't always support things Kevin Harvick says, uh, but I think he nailed it with his uh, with his description of the package in yesterday's race compared to Kyle Busch's. And Brad Keselowski agrees with me as well, I think. Here's what Brad Keselowski said responding to a, to a Kyle Busch's quote. Keselowski said, agree that it's a good thing for a driver that can be true to himself, also careful to understand how fragile everything is right now. Brad Keselowski nails it right there. NASCAR and just everything around it is fragile. It's not thriving, it's not a thriving sport, it's not a dead sport, but it's definitely not a sport that's in a good place. It's fragile. Any announcement, every announcement that NASCAR makes is met with a chorus of cheers or a chorus of boos. Never anything in the middle. And quite often it's split, it's half cheers, half boos. Rarely can people agree even then. Everything in NASCAR is fragile, like Brad Keselowski says there. So whenever you have a high profile driver making these blunt, brash statements about something, it's gonna light a fire under a large portion of the fan base. And when things are already this fragile and things already are kind of this, this in jeopardy for NASCAR, that is not a good thing. And I think Brad Keselowski nails it. You need to be conscious. If you're Kyle Busch, you need to be conscious of this and choose your words more carefully. I'm not one of those people that wants to limit free speech. Like, oh, you can't just say anything. I'm fine with people speaking their minds. But Kyle Busch, if he keeps speaking his mind like this, there's a chance the sport he makes millions of dollars driving won't be around in 10 years. And now I've seen some fans say, well, he has to be blunt or else NASCAR won't listen. That's BS. As we've talked about on this show on a week-to-week -week basis, NASCAR is listening to the fans right now more so than maybe they ever have. They're in constant communication about their new plans for new schedules. They're in constant communication about their, their intentions on getting the Gen 7 car out as soon as possible. NASCAR is in constant communication with the fans right now. And like I said, more so than they probably ever have been. So for people to think that we need brash statements like Kyle Busch's to wake the NASCAR sanctioning body up are just untrue. Think about it. After qualifying a few weeks ago when there was another fiasco where they'd had issues with group qualifying, you had Clint Boyer. He was a little brash, sure, but he at least was up front and actually said what the problems with NASCAR current form of group qualifying. He actually explained what the problems were. And I think his statements, coupled obviously with some of the statements from other drivers that weren't just, it freaking sucks, like Kyle Busch says, that were a little more insightful than that, NASCAR made the change. Fans didn't like it. Drivers obviously didn't like it. So NASCAR, what, two weeks later, changed qualifying. 
and I think probably, according to most fans, for the better. So the idea that we just need to fill Twitter with expletives to get NASCAR to wake up is is untrue to me. I don't believe that at all, and I think that only makes the sport look worse uh, from the outside. People looking at NASCAR after Kyle Busch's statements yesterday think worse of NASCAR than they did before he made those comments. And that's all I'm saying. That's what I think what Brad Keselowski means when he says that everything is fragile right now and you need to be careful about how you say things, how you describe things. Kyle Busch, I mean, I'm recording this early Monday or early Tuesday morning, so I don't know, later in the day, they might, they're probably gonna find Kyle Busch for this and they rightfully should in my opinion. Actions detrimental to stock car racing. I know a lot of people hate that portion of you know the NASCAR rule book, but it's for situations like this. You know, when you have Kevin Harvick, Brad Keselowski, other people kind of actually explaining the problems and their issues with the aero package in a constructive and thoughtful way, no problem. But when you have Kyle Busch who just goes out and makes headlines with brash and thoughtless statements, in my opinion, it's not good for the sport. It's detrimental to stock car racing. So that's what Brad Keselowski means when he says Kyle Busch needs to be more thoughtful. That's basically where I'm at here. I'm not saying I disagree with Kyle Busch. The package at Dover, despite those stats I showed a second ago with all the passes, I didn't think it made Dover any better, and I don't think this aero package is the long-term answer. So I agree with Kyle Busch. This package does suck to some extent. I don't, I don't think it sucks. I wouldn't go that far. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world like some people make it out to be, but it's not optimal. So I don't disagree with Kyle Busch entirely, but I disagree entirely, however, with how he said it. And I think that's something that all NASCAR drivers need to be wary of going forward. You know, gone are the days where you can be like Tony Stewart 15 years ago and just bash every sponsor that NASCAR has. Tony Stewart would go after Goodyear on a weekly basis almost. And that was okay because NASCAR is bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars. If Goodyear wanted to leave because Stewart was being too mean to them, Firestone would have stepped in. Cooper Tire would have stepped in. There were definitely other people out there that would have stepped in because NASCAR was a freaking gold mine. 2019, NASCAR is not the same kind of gold mine. Everything is more fragile. You need to watch what you say. Tony Stewart would not be good for 2019 NASCAR, at least not you know his antics like that. As entertaining as they were in the mid 2000s, that couldn't happen today with the way things are fragile. So I'm gonna keep saying that word because I think Brad Keselowski, when he used it, I thought it was perfect. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I'd be curious to know what you guys think. Obviously, I know I went on kind of a longer rant right here, but I wanted to make my point clear. I don't disagree. I don't disagree with what Kyle Busch said or with, with, with what Kevin Harvick said or Bob Levine or any of those people who criticize the error package. Criticize the error package all you want, but be careful about how you do it. Be productive, be constructive, and be smart with it. Kyle Busch wasn't any of those things with those statements, and that's why I have a problem with it. Anyway, that's... That's my show, that's my episode. Hope you guys enjoyed, definitely got a lot off my chest right there, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thank you all, uh, as always, for watching, I appreciate it. If you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, if you wanna debate me over there on this type of stuff, I'm all ears. Uh, also remember, you can check out down by the description if you wanna support the show, show, support out of the group, you can get yourself a t-shirt down there. Also, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters who I can't live without. Shout out Michael Harrison at Geos of the Stars, SelfishGifts.com, Cameron James, uh, John Coblenz, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Danson, Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, Ross Corlett, TheRacingInsiders.com, and the rest of these amazing Patreon supporters. Thank you all so much for your continued support, and uh, hopefully we can keep this thing going into the future. This has been fun. Really appreciate the support from all of you who watch, all of you who subscribe. I think we just hit 88,000 subscribers uh, just this last weekend. That's probably why Alex Bowman did so well yesterday. 88K, that's why Alex Bowman almost won his first race. I'm gonna go and stick by that. I'm superstitious in that way. Uh, let's see if we can get to 100,000 subscribers maybe by the end of the summer. That's a very lofty goal, probably not realistic, but that would be pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, that being said, thank you so much for the support. Thank you all so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you guys again later this week. Have a good rest of your uh, rest of your Tuesday, everyone.